Game of Thrones has now officially reached big deal status. The ratings are through the roof, the coverage is breathless, and the think pieces and listicles are flying thick and fast. We're sitting at the big table now, folks. We've made it. All those years we spent in school hiding the embarrassing cover art of our favorite books from onlookers are finally going to pay off. Our moment of catharsis has arrived. A story with dragons and sword fights and whatnot has been elevated to the cultural pinnacle that is the HBO flagship series. Except... Except you knew there was going to be an except, didn't you? I'm not the sort of person who doesn't complain about things, after all. At this point, I should warn you of something that many of you have probably already guessed, which is that I'm one of those people. One of the people that read the books and thinks that the books are better than the show. And you should also know going in that I'm perfectly willing to be completely insufferable about it. However, in this case, I believe that I'm using my powers of insufferability for good. The last time a piece of fantasy fiction achieved this level of cultural ubiquity was the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and that shaped the course of the genre for decades to come. It's very likely that George R.R. R. Martin's book series will do the same, and it's up to us insufferable people to ensure that it shapes it right. To explain what I mean by that, let's take a look at the last time this happened, with the works of J.R.R. R. Tolkien. Part 1. The Spirit of Tolkien Tolkien did something that it's very rare for a fantasy author to do. He wedged at least one foot inside the hallowed halls of literary legitimacy. That brought with it academic criticism. One of the more common readings of Lord of the Rings held that the One Ring was meant as an allegory for the nuclear bomb. I never really cared for that reading, and neither did Tolkien. In fact, the author was open about his dislike for allegory in general. I don't like to look too hard for direct symbols or clear metaphors in works of fiction. However, I do believe that a work of fiction, and especially of fantasy fiction, can have a spirit. The spirit of Lord of the Rings can be found in its hero. Or maybe it's better to say it can be found in who its hero isn't. The hero is not heroic Aragorn or impressive Gandalf or expert Legolas. Instead, it's Frodo, a hobbit. Small, vulnerable, gentle, and good-hearted. Frodo's strength as a character lies not in his sword-fighting ability, but in his discomfort with violence, his wish to avoid conflict. In Lord of the Rings, the greatest threat to evil is not the army at its gates, but the people willing to pass on the temptations of power. This is what gives the trilogy its spirit a spirit that's nearly unique not only in fantasy fiction, but in fiction in general. One of the reasons I enjoyed Peter Jackson's movies so much is that, for all their inevitable deviations from the books, they retained this unique spirit. It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. Even the very wise can assume all animals. So if the movies got Lord of the Rings mostly right, what's an example of something that got it wrong? To answer that question, I'm going to borrow the conclusion made by one of my favorite critics, Seamus Young, about a game set in Tolkien's universe called Shadows of Mordor. In it, you play as a ranger named Talion, whose family is killed by the bad guys during the tutorial, and you spend the rest of the game trying to track down said bad guys so you can kill them back. A standard revenge story. However, Young's column, which I've linked to in the video description, correctly argues that a revenge story is incompatible with the spirit of Tolkien. In a true Tolkien story, anger and revenge are destructive, dangerous things. Things to be avoided, not to build wish-fulfillment fantasies out of. From this game, we can see that there's more to getting Tolkien right than the setting details. Even if you get every one of the specifics right, down to the last barely pronounceable syllable and the longest elvish name in the entire Silmarillion, it won't matter if you get the spirit wrong, and Shadow of Mordor gets it wrong. And how, you may be asking, does this relate to Game of Thrones? Well, if it's possible to get the spirit of Tolkien wrong, it must be just as possible to get the spirit of Martin wrong. And in my opinion, HBO's show does exactly that. Not by a little, but by a lot, and I'm going to explain how. An explanation which will, by the way, contain medium-sized spoilers for both the show and the books. If you're a show watcher, I won't spoil anything you don't already know, but if you're determined to avoid spoilers of any kind, this is not the video for you. With that warning out of the way, let's get started. Part 2. The Spirit of Martin The first step in my explanation is to attempt to describe the spirit of A Song of Ice and Fire. It won't be as easy as it was with Tolkien. Martin's series is more complicated in narrative, more realist in spirit, and, to top it all off, still unfinished. 
but I'm going to take a stab at it anyway, and my starting point is going to be a different author entirely, Robert A. Heinlein. Heinlein, if you didn't already know him, was a sci-fi novelist and a major figure in the genre. George R.R. R. Martin frequently cites him as an early inspiration. He was a talented author whose difficult-to-describe politics often came through in his writing. One example of this is his semi-famous saying, which I've paraphrased like this, Violence is the supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Kind of a cynical view of human interaction, isn't it? But it's one that could be useful in reading Martin's books. This saying, which I'll call Heinlein's premise, holds very true in the endless power struggles between Stark, Lannister, and everyone else. And Martin, more so than any other author I can think of, has refused to flinch away from the awful consequences of this premise. In the world of the books, the primary products of medieval-style authoritarianism are war, suffering, and death. It's a place where all the good intentions in the world won't matter if they're fed into the same broken system as the bad ones. Of course, this is all very dark and cynical, isn't it? But for all that, Martin is not a monochromatic author. Sure, his reputation is that of a gleeful sadist who delights in killing off all of your favorite characters. But that reputation is undeserved, and earned by the show much more so than by the books. In fact, my personal opinion is, and has been for some time, that George R.R. R. Martin is a well-disguised idealist. Remember how I told you that I was one of those people, meaning a book reader? Well, even among book readers, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those those people. One that enjoyed the fourth book in the series, A Feast for Crows, which has the unfair reputation of being the boring one. But in my opinion, A Feast for Crows started an important tonal shift in the spirit of the series. Without going into details, partly because they're spoilers, but mostly because it would take too long, the fourth book features, for the first time, significant exploration and questioning of Heinlein's premise. The wandering Septon Maribald and the inhabitants of the monastery at Quiet Isle display a carefully considered, almost pacifistic worldview, for instance. And as the story continues into the fifth book, John and Daenerys both approach, with great difficulty, a different kind of authority, one based not on the direct or indirect threat of violence, but on what we today would call the social contract. In short, the books begin to show an interest in wriggling out from underneath the Heinleinian boot. The contrast between these character moments and the bloody, ruthless world that surrounds them makes them that much more admirable, that much more vital. That's the spirit of A Song of Ice and Fire to me, one that critiques authoritarian politics and respects the value of ideals in a fallen world. Was this Martin's intention? Well, fortunately for me, that doesn't matter, because Martin is the author, and is, therefore, dead, which, if anything, will probably make Winds of Winter take even longer to come out. But it's my personal reading of the series, and it's one where the show suffers from the comparison. You see, the show rarely does any of the things I just described. It keeps the occasional shred of the original spirit, sure, but more often it just gets it exactly backwards. While the books explore and critique Heinlein's premise, for the most part the show just wallows in it, in a way that's almost obscene to me at this point. And one of their wallowing methods in particular is the worst of all, which I'll discuss in part three. The Cult of the Badass. In the book series, Daenerys Targaryen is a young woman suddenly thrust into a position of immense complexity and responsibility. For all that her experience exceeds her years, she is still a teenager, still confused, still emotional, still unsure. And yet she turns this vulnerability into a sort of wisdom, and becomes a unique and even admirable manager of the nearly hopeless political quagmire that is Meereen. In the show, Danny is a total badass! Remember the time when she locked those people in that safe thing? Or the time she dropped the whip like a mic? Or the other time she burned all those dudes to death in that one place? That was awesome! In the books, Arya is at this point a deeply troubling character. She's been through years of constant stress and terror that no one her age should ever have to go through, and it's damaged her personality. It's become unsettling how comfortable she is with violence, how it's become normal to her. And now she's in the care of a religious cult that's training her to become a full-time professional killer. In the show, Arya is a total badass! Remember when she dropped the coin in front of that one guy and then totally stabbed him? Or that other time when she was willing to fight three people over a dead pigeon and she's all like, Nothing's worth anything to dead men. That was awesome! Or that time Oberyn stabbed the guy in the wrist and he was all cool and casual about it, like talking to the guy and stuff. Or the time, what's her name, the Sand Snake speared that guy in the face, and the other one speared the other guy in the face. Or maybe it was the same one, I don't remember. But it was awesome! Have you guessed yet how sick to fucking death I am of badasses? It's not just the show's fault. I spent my teenage years in the 90s, the grim darkiest decade of them all. 
between then and now, I've had badasses of every conceivable stripe and color shoved down my throat for more than 20 years running at this point. But their presence here is especially galling. You see, the badass is a creature designed by and for Heinlein's premise. In the Heinleinian world, the only path to safety, security, and independence is to be comfortable with violence, or better yet, stylish with it. In the cult of the badass, the highest achievement to which a character can aspire is the ability to kill people with a completely blank look on their face. There's no room for Septon Maribald in a show like this. If there was, he'd probably have been tortured to death by Ramsay Snow or something by now. All those moments in the Riverlands, at the quiet isle on the wall in Marine, the moments that you could, for lack of a better word, call good ass, they're gone, unnecessary, extraneous to the proceedings. We're in the world of Heinlein's premise now, where cynicism is nothing less than wisdom and pacifism is nothing more than naivete. And that's my beef with the show. I don't care that Asha is called Yara now for some reason. I don't care so much that characters go to the wrong places or live and die when they're not supposed to, or that storylines are changed or added or left out. I care that the spirit of A Song of Ice and Fire hasn't made it from the page to the screen the way it did with Lord of the Rings. I don't think the show is bad. It's well-costumed, well-acted, often well-directed, and sometimes well-written. But it's also nasty and vicious and glib in a way that the books never were. If you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> Remember at the beginning of the video when I said that Martin's books would shape fantasy for a long time to come? That's unfortunately also true of the show. The show's failure to retain the spirit of the books has interfered with the literary function of their fantasy elements. And yes, fantasy elements can have a literary function. I know that the unwritten rule of the Game of Thrones think piece is that, for every three paragraphs you write, you have to spend two of them reassuring your readers that the fantasy elements are just dumb schlock that can be safely ignored. But I'm here to deassure you of that. Just as the One Ring served a literary function in Lord of the Rings, the dragons serve a literary function here. In the beginning of the story, the dragons are a source of potential power. A fully grown dragon is a nearly game-breaking military weapon in a world where military power is the purest kind. And to a young Daenerys and her tiny, vulnerable Kalazar, that power is the most obvious route to safety and independence. But the problem with dragons is that they just keep getting bigger, and bigger, and wilder, and more dangerous, and by the time you realize you never really had control of them to begin with, it's too late. Like I said earlier, I don't usually like to employ allegory or direct symbolism in my readings of fictional works, but sometimes it's damn near unavoidable. The dragons embody both the initial allure and the inevitable consequences of governing by force. But what happens if you take them out of the books and drop them into the show? What happens when they're in a story that too often celebrates the use of violence as a political tool rather than questioning it? Then they become extraneous. They go from being a powerful thematic focus to just being expensive eye candy. I want to help the world realize that fantasy fiction could be more than pulp, more than trash. To do that, I have to be honest about both the strengths of the novels and the shortcomings of the show. Martin accomplished something with A Song of Ice and Fire, something worthwhile. He preserved the spirit of Tolkien. He brought it intact into a style of fantasy that draws its narrative habits from realism rather than mythology. The show wouldn't know the spirit of Tolkien if Sam hit it in the face with a frying pan. I don't hate the show. I might even like it. I mean, I still watch it, don't I? And I see that the upcoming episode is called The Broken Man, a phrase that should pique the interest of Septon Maribald fans everywhere. Maybe the show will prove me wrong. It's not any more complete than the books are, after all. But until then, I can't help but see it as an opportunity squandered. A work that's been diminished in its transition from page to screen, and which may diminish the reputation of its genre along with it.